anyway, let me get going here. Uh, just for uh, background in that, I, I'm located at the uh, West Center, the Water Energy and Sustainability Technology Center, which is uh, right next to the Agua, Neva, Agua Nueva Wastewater Treatment Plant. And we moved in about seven years ago. The, it's about a 22,000 square uh, foot facility that was built by Pima County. Uh, and that uh, Ian Pepper and I were allowed to actually design this facility. Uh, and it, it has my dream in it. I have sewage on tap in my laboratory, something I've always wanted, <laughs> but I don't have to go to the wastewater plant. Um, but it, it, it basically, we, we were able to do pilot plant scale testing of water reuse systems here. And we have state of the art uh, chemistry and microbiology laboratories for monitoring wastewater. And about seven years ago, we started monitoring the wastewater coming into the plant, leaving the plant here. Um, to get an idea of a plant efficiency. Largely our focus is virology because that, that I'm a trained virologist by training actually. Uh, and we wanted to get an idea and, and you can see actually the uh, changes in virus concentrations uh, over the year. Like in the winter you see noroviruses which causes diarrhea. Winter virus starts coming in in October, November, late part of the year. And then the summer viruses come in and that. So it's, it's great, it's been a great tool. And when the SARS-CoV outbreak uh, started, we, we were ready to go uh, for uh, doing this study. Now, this you've gotten on a new term, it's called sewage surveillance. Uh, it's been around for actually quite a while. Uh, it, it's actually been used by the World Health Organization, is currently being used, to track down poliovirus cases in the developed world. Uh, particularly in uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nigeria, what they can do is they can test a village, the sewage coming out, and determine whether anybody in that village is infected with poliovirus. And then if they find a case, then they go in and vaccinate uh, in that, that community in that. In, in Finland and Israel, they use it to determine if there's any cases that have come into their country by monitoring the wastewater. They're very sensitive to uh, that. So they've been doing that for about 40 years, actually, monitoring the water and wastewater. Uh, so it's been a real a tool. And it was noticed years ago in Finland, they could detect one case in 10,000 by the methods they had at the time. But now with the uh, development of molecular methods with the SARS coronaviruses that people in Europe found, they could detect one case in 100,000 that was infected. Uh, why is that so? And that's because an individual excretes large amounts of virus. The SARS COVID-2 uh, uh, virus actually infects not only upper respiratory tract, but infects the uh, intestines too, and it replicates in the intestines. So you find large amounts of the virus in the feces, uh, not only, and in urine, the virus is excreted in large numbers in urine. Don't let your uh, urologist ever tell you urine is sterile, it's not. If you're infected with a virus, you're excreting uh, an infectious viruses a lot of the time. So uh, it's, it, in fact, there was a paper out showing that you get aerosols from urinals with the SARS-CoV-2 recently too. So I flush and run all the time, man, guys, I don't hang around. Uh, but you're excreting millions, actually billions of virus. A person infected with norovirus will excrete 10 to the 13 viruses per day to give you a rough idea. So the amount, is large. The other thing that happens in sewer systems um, is that it's retarded. So if you flush a virus down one toilet in the city, you'll find it at the sewage plant for the next four days. So it's not an immediate bolus flush like you might see with the chemical because you really, they're like sticky ping pong balls bouncing around the sewer line. So they're not all coming out at one time. So that does offer an advantage. Uh, some of the advantages of monitoring wastewater systems are you can determine the success or failure of interventions. You know, we've been monitoring here on a regular basis since the, the outbreak of the coronavirus here. And we saw that it rise very rapidly in March and when stay at home orders went into effect, it took a deep dive uh, in the amount of viruses that we were finding in the wastewater crack. And then we, we, after the 4th of July, when things started opening it, it took another peak uh, of viruses came, it was shot up again very rapidly, in fact, higher than it had been before. And, but it's been coming down for the last several uh, days now, week. 
Uh, we, so you can actually get an idea of what's going on in interventions. Now, the other thing is people start excreting before they become clinically ill. That was noticed a long time ago with polio virus. But generally what we're seeing is what's going to happen in the next seven or 10 days when the, when the uh, coronavirus cases started going down. We saw it starting going down before the, it was seen with the clinical cases. And uh, certainly when it rose in July, we got it seven days before the, the rise occurred in the clinical cases. We saw it happening in the wastewater. Uh, so it's been really a good tool from that way. We can see a little bit, not a little bit into the future. The hope is if methods become more sensitive, we might see further into the future. Uh, and one of the things we've done at the University of Arizona, we can identify facilities with infected individuals is one of the things that we're here doing here at the University of Arizona is touching individual dorms to see if we can uh, pinpoint cases that might be occurring or clusters of cases at the University of Arizona. That's a new tool that really hadn't been used much before. It hadn't been used at all before. And, and we kind of jumped on that right away. Uh, other universities are starting to pick up on that now uh, and looking at the, the individual facilities because doing the, the individual clinical cases is very costly, very expensive. And, and, and I was at a meeting yesterday and they felt it hasn't been very useful to date uh, because you have to really continually test the students every few days. Uh, so it's a lot less costly than doing clinical tests all the time. You can pinpoint where you want to do the clinical tests a little bit easier. Uh, so that's been another advantage to this type of testing. So what's really involved in this is really going to a wastewater treatment plant or a facility, going to a sewer line from the facility, collecting about a one liter sample uh, what we do is and we only analyze about 100 milliliters, but then we archive that for future studies or for verification of it. Uh, and then we process that, assess that down, actually taking 100 milliliters down to about two, one to two milliliters. And then we use molecular methods to identify the nucleic acid uh, of the virus by doing RT-PCR. Actually, some of our colleagues at other universities are actually sequencing and they've really discovered several new genotypes of the virus that evolved on their campus, believe it or not, as the infection has been transmitted among uh, the students in that. We're not doing that in the future we can. Fortunately, these students, these, I mean, these samples are preserved for years. So you, we can come back many years later and look at questions we haven't. Actually, what we'd like to do is look at our samples, which we've been collecting on a regular basis, and to see when we first got a detect of the coronavirus. Some people say they could detect it as far back as December in, in uh, China, and that we want to really look to see when the first cases really appeared in Tucson. We hope to do that at some point. But currently, right now, there are, are probably over 100 facilities doing the sewage epidemiology around the world and, and uh, probably dozens uh, in the United States are currently do. Many universities are doing it, many health departments are doing it. The, the uh, Centers for Disease Control is going to be looking at 100 wastewater treatment plants and the um, and NIH has uh, indicated they're going to spend $20 million funding different okay, so when I places to uh, develop this technology. So I think it's something uh, that's going to really uh, take off now. The nice thing is we can monitor all kinds of illnesses uh, by this. Uh, not only enteric illnesses, but you can find like herpes viruses in the wastewater, uh, for example, or other viruses. You can see if the evolution of them and if they've been introduced into uh, neighborhoods or, or regions at time. Some people of our colleagues are actually segregated neighborhoods and are looking at the virus, how it spreads from one neighborhood to another in a community. Uh, they've been collecting both the clinical data and the uh, and, and the um, uh, sewage data at times. So it's quite revealing. They, they, they were getting an idea how it spreads within the community from one neighborhood to another by analyzing the data. So it's a, going to be a useful technology in, in, the, in the future, I think, for that. One of the things, too, and do it again, you showed here our, our colleagues in uh, the Netherlands have shown by graphing data, both clinical and uh, the wastewater analysis, they, they pretty much feel they got a 10 day lead time when cases are gonna go up and when they're gonna go down. So they verified that with SARS uh, COVID-2, uh, which we feel is gonna be very useful when we get to the vaccine 
because uh, we'll, uh, oh, when the vaccine becomes available, we'll, we'll be able to see how good it is by monitoring the number of cases. Even if they use a live vaccine, it's possible to differentiate like they do with polio between uh, the, a live vaccine and cases of the, uh, the virulent virus too. So we're very hopeful to see how low it potentially could be used to, to track down students uh, on a campus and determine uh, if we have a student who's, who's not vaccinated and how successful the vaccination will be. So we feel there's a lot of opportunities here to use this. Let me, let me go and talk about the case that occurred at the University of Arizona uh, on August 25th. Uh, the, the Lycans dorm uh, wastewater was sampled. And what we do is we have a group, uh, an undergraduate and a, a, a full-time engineer here who actually sampled several uh, sewer lines from the dorms. And, and, the, and the samples were brought here uh, and then they were tested during the day. And we got the results around 5 p.m. because uh, we'd, we'd optimize this so we could do it all in the same day. And then uh, got a phone call that night doc, and Dr. Pepper uh, announced it to the U of A task group dealing with this uh, that evening that we actually had a hit in one of the dorms. And there was a, a meeting late that night and the decision was made to test the students to like in dorm the next day using the antigen and PCR tests. Uh, and it was also made the decision we go back to the sewer line and take five samples every five minutes apart because one of the concerns was that was this just a bolus we were looking at how uh, were we just lucky that we took the sample at the right time? Well, when those five samples were analyzed, they all had identical results over that 25 minute span. So we felt, wow, okay, just taking a grab sample rather than putting a device in there that would do a continuous sampling would work very well. And of course, uh, two students were identified by the antigen test and one by the PCR test. Um, and then they were you know, put in quarantine. And then the next day, the next morning, the sewer line was sampled and the sample was negative and remained negative for the next three days. So we felt we actually had identified uh, those students uh, and the, in, the amount of testing of the dormitories has increased since that time. Uh, and we did actually get some hits on Monday. Um, apparently the students were found and the samples went negative the next day. So we feel we have a, a good idea, something that might actually work uh, we're getting some hits again here and there, uh, but hopefully we found a tool that we can at least identify clusters of cases and, and get those students isolated to maybe hopefully reduce the spread of the virus. Unfortunately, we, uh, we can't sample every dorm or facility every day. And, and sometimes several dorms are on one sewer line, so it makes it a little bit more difficult. But we feel have a technology, at least in one situation, we believe we, we help control the spread of the virus in the storm. But this technology is currently involved. The National Science Foundation has funded a, a, a group that we meet regularly online now at different universities and different health departments around the country that are using this technology. We're comparing our results. Nothing is standardized here. We don't have standardized sampling methods or assay methods available right now. So we're hoping to compare all our data and eventually develop a standardized method that can be used uh, for a monitoring system. There are a lot of advantages to this. I, I see in the future, it, we, we can compare one community to another. My, my real goal, uh, hopefully, is to show that uh, certain areas of the community may not uh, have the, it, will we get an idea, be honest, who, who has uh, access to medical care? Because we're going to see difference in infection rates. If communities have poor health care in one community, compare it to another, we'll be able to identify communities that need, I think, increased health care, increased vaccination, uh, and the control, and also we'll be able to look at other types of interventions. You know, one of the things, other area we're looking at a lot at the university is how we control the spread in facilities. We can't keep disinfecting classrooms between every class or buses between every bus load. And one of the other things we're working on is continuously acting disinfectants where you apply a paint or a coating and it'll last anywhere from 24 hours to 90 months in some of our facilities. And 
we just help a company get registered with EPA, the first antiviral coating uh, that will last up to seven days in facilities. And what we really would like to go is and see if we applying this type of technology, how successful we might be in, in controlling the spread, at least uh, with surfaces or, or inanimate surfaces or how important they are in facilities in controlling the spread of SARS-CoV-2 or other viruses for that. So we really feel we have a lot of opportunities that uh, haven't been realized with this type of technology that we could use. And we can monitor whole populations and that, that's our benefit. Now I'll leave it at that and try to answer any questions. That's a, an astonishing story. Uh, Chuck, um, it's really incredibly creative and um, the opportunities to limit the spread are astonishing when you can have a lead time of seven or even 10 days in advance. Um, I have one question then I'll, others can jump in. Um, so in, in at Pima County, you've got a fairly large aggregate of water and you're sampling that whole thing. Um, it must be it must pose some challenges as scientists to look at, uh, I don't know what it is, but there's a sewer pipe leaving the, the, the dormitory, but does it go to a collection tank so that there's a large amount of material that came from the showers and toilets and sinks of that dormitory over what, the last 24 hours? Uh, how does that yeah, work? The, the, the virus probably in, in a large sewer shed probably is going to persist a longer period of time rather than one sewer line. Uh, yeah, sewer sheds is a new word that just came out about six months ago. We're calling these sewer sheds. Uh, what you can do, you probably have a longer time. I think we've been successful because we get it in the morning, you know, usually 8, 30, 9. Fortunately, students sleep late, right? So we can easily catch their first flush during the day when they go to the bathroom and take showers, you know, uh, and, 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 and take it later in the day rather than earlier in the morning. Uh, and, and, but I think with the, we can, we know uh, with Pima County, we can get into certain communities, sewer lines. Other people have been doing this, like the uh, uh, University of Oregon has been go, going and identifying cities. What they've been doing is when there's an outbreak in a the city, they didn't they go in and they look at the sewer lines and find where it, those cases are, they clustered in one part of that town. And the, so they can identify those and then do clinical sampling in that area. And of course, the future may be is then you would run in there and try to encourage the people to get vaccinated when there's a vaccine available. So we'll be able to really do source tracking in a way of infectious diseases uh, um, among humans. But it's possible we could really uh, do different neighborhoods in Tucson if we want in the future. That's one of our hopes. We, we really like to identify and what are communities that show that, that I think you'll help identify communities that don't have the proper health care or access to health care. I think we can help the health department saying, you know, th this neighborhood, you already realize that we have the data here to show you that this neighborhood has more cases as being impacted greater and that we should target that because that could be the focal point that's spreading uh, the, uh, infectious diseases to other parts of the community. At least that's my, 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 one of my hopes that we can do that. We'll have a better handle on controlling infectious diseases spread within communities and even buildings in office buildings and that we can monitor a whole office building or a whole, uh, we could, you know, in the meat plant, I'll give me an example where they've had problems with the spread. We could monitor the wastewater coming out of the plant uh, and really tell you if anybody's infected that rather than necessarily screening everybody all the time. And I think the other advantage is we have a lead time. The person will start excreting the virus probably before they'll be able to pick it up clinical cases. I think we have a seven day lead time. So we can monitor a, 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 like a manufacturing plant and say, hey, there's somebody who's infected in there. You're not picking it up in your clinical test because the infection just started. Robert, I think, let's see, people want to raise their hands. I know Mark has been waving his hand. Sure. Well, the, uh, so uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's fascinating work. I'm wondering, and this may be uh, a question beyond the, the sort of scientific focus that's the base of your work, but scalability here on campus, 
We talk about Pima National. I mean, what if every meat producer called tomorrow and said, what does this take, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, collection analysis, what's the cost, uh, how much of this is equipment that has to be produced or it exists and it's really just setting up processes to get the leader of output at a certain time, you know, how accessible are sewer lines. I mean, if we, we've asked at the law school and I think a number of units that aren't right now on the wastewater treatment wanted to be, we asked actually some time ago and uh, would still love to be, you know, what's the, how oh. uh -oh. Mark, Mark, we lost you. I, I think the question was the yeah. scalability. Is that correct? Yeah, Mark, yeah. Mark, you, you froze. So we're finishing your sentence for you. I, I think your question is about scalability of this. Is that is that right? Oh, that now now maybe you're back. And commercialization and having this done and how versus setting up processes. Yeah, I, I think I got the question. That's a good question. What's the sustainability in that? Well, things are happening very fast. Uh, a company just a month ago uh, that works in the wastewater industry produ produced a test kit for testing sewage. IDEX now has one anybody can purchase, any wastewater utility can purchase. Another company outside of uh, 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 Connecticut, I think Yale or Harvard, uh, has a company called BioBot, where you can actually offer the surface the service to any wastewater uh, utility or anybody that wants it to. And I've been contacted by several other companies that want to develop test kits. Uh, companies that uh, work with developing medical test kits now want to get into this area because they see it as a new market. Uh, but the sustainability with the cost, I think this will drive the cost down a lot because right now, you know, our costs are about, material costs are $150 a sample, but the development of test kits and, and standard techniques um, and, and when the sample, I think, are rapidly be developed, I think uh, what I'm getting and hearing and seeing company get, Test kits going to be available. This will drive the cost down substantially, uh, and, and it's far cheaper than than uh, clinical testing. Clinical testing costs some some places are spending uh, thirty million dollars in clinical testing since this started. Believe it or not, some health departments. So they see it, it as a boom uh, to cover large segments of the population. So, but that's a good issue. I, I, I it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. But all the industry is excited now. Give you an idea. There are companies out there you can call up will offer service and come out and test the wastewater and they'll do it and monitor it routinely. There are companies that will come out and, and test your facility before you open your office. They'll test all the rooms and make sure there's no coronavirus in it. I hope I answered uh, Robert, that. we have a few questions in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll throw them out. So uh, uh, Leslie asks, could this be adapted to, for use in controlling the next pandemic? Uh, we also have a question, can this be used to monitor neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, a question of which labs are actually conducting the assays? Okay, uh, uh, what was the first question again? <laughs> yeah. um, can this be used to control the next pandemic? Oh yeah, definitely what's gonna really happen. I, I, I'm sure given the involvement now of the Centers for Disease Control being heavily involved, uh, is it'll probably be used to monitor. If we start seeing cases of SARS-3 coming out in, in uh, China, they're gonna start monitoring intensively in the US. They're, we're gonna be using it to monitor whole systems. Uh, obviously this whole field has taken off uh, and it's been shown it's been incredibly useful to date already. So uh, you're gonna see that. And I, I think we'll do it as neighborhoods too. I think they're gonna probably uh, look at neighborhoods so they can identify neighborhoods where there's more clusters of cases and then if there's a vaccine available or treatment, they'll go into those neighborhoods right away. That's what's been done with the polio virus. They identify a neighborhood and they come in and put in workers in there going door to door uh, and, then, and to uh, either vaccinate or identify those cases. So we're going we're gonna to see that, I'm, I'm sure, in the future because it, it's been incredibly successful, I think, to date from the limited work that's really been available. Uh, what was the third one here? I... Um, 
what are the labs that oh labs uh, yeah testing? yeah right now I would guess there's probably over a hundred labs doing this work right now uh, on it uh, uh, there, there most of the major universities are doing this right now I've been in contact with dozens of them they're asking our protocols and how we set this how we set it up and now so it's being done all over the country. I would say uh, last time I heard about 300 wastewater utilities who are using it and doing the testing right now. But most of the laboratories right now are, are focused in universities and a couple of health departments because we, the technology of the molecular methods are fairly new for this. And so it's largely been the universities and maybe two or three private companies offering the service right now. But that's expanding rapidly. Um, I had a follow-up question to to the sort of, I guess, the next pandemic, and that is the new home construction. So should we be going to the construction industry and saying, you know, when you're building a new subdivision, you should construct it in this way so that we can more, we can isolate your wastewater to be able to test it. Is that, does that make would that be a smart thing to do? You know, I, I think that's a good idea. For, neighborhoods are pretty easy to get because they have trunk sewer lines, but make it easier to get into facilities like paternities and, and, and dorms would be easier. I think when you, if you're going to build a big facility like a meatpacking plant, let's say where they've had issues, make sure you have a sewer line, you have access, you can easily get in there or uh, a tap, you can easily tap into the wastewater because uh, then you can monitor the whole facility. Uh, I think that's what we'll probably see, uh, to be honest, because it, it's an incredible tool. You can learn a lot about the people that work there, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, we had a uh, comment um, from uh, Jeffrey F F Femi. Um, Please be more clear on your quip about the restroom. Don't flush, go outside, bring a jar to your office. <laughs> what should we yeah. do? Um, yeah, actually, um, I published several toilet papers, I was saying early. I did a lot on potential for disease spread by toilets years ago based on the aerosol transmission of it. And, and you do, I, too bad, uh, I have a slide, uh, I did a time-lapse photograph of a toilet flush and it looks like a thermonuclear explosion coming out of your toilet bowl, actually, because of the droplets. Uh, that's why I always say, I was saying, keep your toothbrush three feet away for safety there. Otherwise you could brush your teeth with your thought and you flushed down the toilet. But what, can, what we learned, uh, th there is potential to contamination around the area. And people recently with the SARS-CoV-2 found evidence uh, suggestive that toilets were involved in some of the spread. But what we found that the best thing was to do with automatic toilet bowl uh, cleaners. You know, those you put in the, the tank to do? Well, they are very effective actually because they're a detergent and they would kill the, the, the uh, envelope lipid containing, fatty containing a, a virus. So they were, they were quite effective actually, automatic toilet bowl cleaners. So I put those in. Unfortunately, they found out urinals created thing. I don't know what to do with those, but I always flush and run anyway. I don't like to get hit by the spray in front of them. Well, it's something you wouldn't know, but anyway. Uh, uh, they can put actually automatic dispensers if it really becomes a major issue. Of course, the real technique is, is to, to make sure you wa wash your hands or use a hand sanitizer. On your hands. Okay, and um, uh, we got a question. Is there a need for revisions to municipal and county codes to facilitate testing? And uh, I, what are know. the... Oh, okay. Well, I'll just I was going to say the uh, codes are one fine. question at a time. Yeah, we, we, we haven't had much uh, difficulty with access with it. But the other kind I saw was legal issues. Well, I was leave that up to the mm -hmm. law school to figure out because that issue has come up. because we're, we're, It hasn't been one today because we don't know the individuals for the, monitoring a whole community in that or a facility. It hasn't been an issue today um, be, because we don't know the individuals. But if it then becomes, if you want to use that to, to track down the individuals, then, then I, I assume there might be legal implications at, at that point. But it hasn't been yet an issue because we can't identify who the persons are unless we go in and do clinical testing. Uh, let's see, Carol Rose, what are the implications for green architectures plans for composting toilets? Uh, yeah, well, that's a good issue. Fortunately, at least the SARS-CoV-2 is a very wimpy virus. E even uh, moderate increases in temperature, uh, you know, like uh, 
40 degrees centigrade or around 190 degrees centigrade will kill off this virus in time. And usually composting toilets generate enough heat. It shouldn't be an issue. I've tested a lot of composting toilets in Arizona for uh, a, a Arizona Department of Environmental Quality regulations, and I've never found a virus in it. The temperatures get warm enough. I do like the green toilets, though, with the, the, you know, the flushless urinals. I don't have to worry about getting sprayed. So. So I can talk at the same time. I don't have to worry about it. Carol, Carol, you've got a follow-up question. Just unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, uh, what I actually meant was, uh, can composting toilets be tested for the virus? If the heat kills off the virus, are you going to know that anybody had it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, good point. Yeah, you could test the composting toilets. We, we have been testing sewage sludges and solid material. Most of the vi virus actually ends up in the sewage solid material in the sewage in that, in that. But yeah, you, we, you could test it for composting. We've tested viruses for composting before for uh, uh, ADEQ regulations and that. So it can be done. Okay. Um, you know, on this uh, privacy issue, are there any, um, would there be any other biomarkers that might be individualistic that, um, you know, would uh, sort of get you down into that, those privacy considerations that it's not just everybody could have yeah. this, you could have some particular? Well, you can actually find herpes viruses, uh, for example, because if you get infected, I mean, you can track down venereal diseases, let me be honest. So that's why I go like, huh, how far do we want to go with this? Uh, uh, but if you're excreting herpes all the time, it's going to be the same herpes virus. So if I did a clinical a test, I could identify you. So I think that's where the issue would come in. Or particularly with a lot of viruses, you're going to excrete them like the rest of your life, like a, a retrovirus is, if, if you actually test the air in a room, in, in a daycare center, the most common viruses are herpes, because when a kid gets it, he's got it his whole life. And you're going to have, because of that, you're going to get a certain signal on that virus, and you could probably track down that person comparing what you got in the wastewater with the clinical test. So I think there, are, there could be some really serious issues with that, how this information could potentially be used. I, I did work with DARPA on this, because I said, you know, if uh, you had a person that was a hostage in a community, say, in, a, in the Middle East, I could test the sewage and tell you whether they're Europeans in there or, or Americans or South Americans by uh, the, the herpes virus signal because they're regional or parvovirus signals which people get all their life. I could tell you at least if they had a hostage from North America in the sewage in, the, in a village in the Middle East, uh, on it. Uh, so it, it could potentially be done. Hasn't been done yet, but th there's a potential for that that I see. Hmm. Um, and a follow-up question on that, um, also from Jeffrey, but DNA is DNA, so you could track to a person by DNA, yeah. right? Yeah, you could do that. Oh, they're going to be excreting DNA. Uh, you, you excrete intestinal cells. Man, I'll tell you, if you got hemorrhoids, you're excreting a lot of cells all the time. Uh, just from my experience, but you could actually pe find individual people's DNA in the sewage. You could tell if you had a history of it, you could probably, I didn't think about that until you brought it up, but you could probably determine the individual there if you had to, by testing the wastewater. I don't think that technology has been developed for human cells yet, but it, it, it may have, but, but it's a possibility I could identify an individual by their DNA. If I had, if I had it on file, I could probably identify them. So Kirsten, as far as you know, oh. Kirsten, this is Val Little. Val, welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I have two comments. Um, one is circling back to the question about testing at the individual home level. Uh -huh. I think that most houses have to have in their sewer system, in their, in their uh, wastewater system, have to have a clean out. And right. so hopefully that would be an easy point of entry to be able to test at that point if necessary. The other comment I have is that Dr. Gerba is so good at what he does. And the thing that's so great about him in addition to the quality of his work is he loves his work. 
I play with mainly because it's always uh, interesting every day. But you're right. Every home has a clean out. Of course, you'd have to have permission from the owner because that's where privacy issues might come in. But an owner could test if it got cheap enough. They oh, could that's test. right. Yes. I, 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 the clean, also, you have clean outs on the dorms. They could also be used, too, because every facility, Mr. Rotorooter has to get in there somehow. Right. Uh, so that could be used uh, also. But that's a good point, Val. Uh, Chuck, have, have other countries um, been interested in this? Uh, maybe you covered this while I had was trying to deal yeah, with it. Yeah, oh, it's, been, it's all over the world. Oh, yeah, you name it, Australia, Europe, China, everywhere, because they, they saw the potential immediately uh, for it. So it's all over the world right now. There's international group coordinating it through World Health Organization. Now, World Health Organization is seeing this as a boom also, but it's just evolving uh, right now, but very rapidly. Uh, another question, could this adapted for use on sites? You're going to have to repeat that one. <laughs> uh, could this be adapted for septic systems in rural areas uh, yeah, out in the country? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yes, it can be. We were, uh, we, we've been sampling isolated camps that use uh, pit latrines or septic tanks in Canada to try to identify. They're largely workers who are working in Canada uh, on highways or other remote locations in that uh, or construction facilities. And we've been using that to monitor because they're concerned that somebody would come in there with a case and then uh, spread it among these. So yeah, it can be used in isolated facilities. These are really holding tanks that we've been doing, but it could be used in a septic tank situation too. Viruses tend to persist a lot longer in septic tanks as they're holding the wastewater there all the time. Uh, so yeah, we, we've done virus testing of septic tanks over the years for other reasons to look at water quality issues and that, but they could be done for that. I can think of another question, um, and this is this is kind of um, just sort of it's a bit of a leap from your research, but uh, it kind of goes to the whole idea of you know fluoride in our water systems. You know, rather than um, here we're talking about testing the back end, um, should we be doing more in the front end to protect us from the virus? Is there any? Um, maybe the water we put into our toilet tanks? I, I don't know. Uh, the, I mean, uh, as you, well as the water we drink that, or something. No, no, no that's, a, that's a really good question. Uh, we uh, work on that a lot. You know, with the molecular methods, like, in, and we did a survey nationally, you know, before EPA mandated disinfection of groundwater. And, you know, we found almost a quarter of the groundwater system wells in the United States had viruses in it by molecular methods. But they're very, very low concentrations. We're sampling 100 milliliters. We were sampling 1,000 liters. Uh, so a big difference. So I think the likelihood is, is low. But uh, in, in sampling groundwater systems, uh, we were quite surprised how often they were contaminated with viruses in that. But I think given the concentration has to be pretty large in the wastewater, I, I, I don't think you, we would worry about that too much. Uh, on it. And, and usually because water is disinfected, usually it, it wouldn't be infectious virus anyway. So I don't think we would have to worry about it. Uh, I, 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 somebody just asked, what, what uh, uh, is it easy to detect SARS? Oh, really easy. Uh, it has a big genome. Uh, and people excrete lots of it from what we're finding out. I mean, values coming into the plant here were as high as 125 million per liter at the peak of the outbreak. Uh, so uh, it, people were putting a lot of it into the sewer systems. Uh, even now, uh, we're starting, we're getting below uh, uh, 10,000 per liter now. So things have come way down, but uh, you, you get a lot of it being excreted in the wastewater. It's fairly easy to detect, actually, uh, with the methods we have available today. Chuck, the stuff, the stuff that you're testing, is it, it seems almost as though it's a snapshot in time. Yeah. And it depends really on 
you said time of day, but it's not a big holding tank where it will be kept separate. It's, it's simply a line that's moving water through it. Does that present a weakness? Well, not much afraid. What they did is in studies, they flushed bolus of the polio virus down a wastewater treatment plant in Helsinki, and they could find the virus for the next four days from just one toilet flush. Uh, what it is, it's retarded. It's like sticky ping pong balls bouncing down the sewer line. So it all doesn't come like a chemical as a bolus flush. So we believe we're looking at, uh, a, a day, a, 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 for several days, we'll have a hit. Now that depends on the size of the sewer system, okay? An individual dorm, from what we're seeing, uh, if we get the students out of there, that's flushed out in a day or uh, within a day. Uh, so I think it's just the size of your sewer shed, to be honest. The bigger, the more it's going to be retained in that sewer, sewer shed. Uh, okay, thanks. I think we're starting to wrap up. Let me, uh, let me suggest that we end the formal session here. Anyone who wants can stay on and talk with Chuck and Kirsten and me and others. Um, but uh, I really, Chuck, can't thank you enough. It's just sure. it's, it's fascinating work. It's terribly important work. And it's, it's great to have someone like you at the University of Arizona. Thanks. So anyone who wants to hang on. And we'll be whatever, back. Uh, yes, and, and Robert, did you mention in the beginning, we'll be back uh, the next uh, first Friday of October? Yep, yep. We're on for the first Friday. The schedules have been sent out. If you need one, contact either uh, Kirsten or me and we'll get you one. But I think anyone who is a member of the EBC uh, is on the list serve and should have received it and should have been able to just plug it into their schedule and bring up bring it up and the zoom link will be there hey Chuck this is Mark and I don't know if you can hear me again I could hear you yeah <laughs> all right sorry about the internet I, I blame my teenage children and their schools for our problems so or my wife was a uh, in, in the College of Public Health, anyone but me. Um, so my earlier questions, you answered it largely, but it had to do with scalability at every level, starting with on campus, right? If we wanted to put 50 more buildings online, what I was asking was how much of that is technical equipment or just process and money? In other words, if collection is simple and can be done safely and you know, what's the bandwidth on lab and processing, uh, and then could you do it with 100 or 1,000 buildings in Pima or 10,000 in the West? And then the second part of this was commercialization. And if so many labs are doing this and it really, it, well, there aren't standards yet, they could emerge quickly and or be competing standards. But I'm wondering, you know, as, uh, as I hope we all do, if there's a, 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 on so many levels of what you're doing, including right now COVID, if there's a commercial potential. Yeah, no, I think you're right. This is rapidly evolving. There's a lot of, I'm, in, you know, I, I'm, people are calling me all the time about in, in business development. A lot of people are going to try to make businesses out of this and opportunities to make products and do it. Uh, to me, I can't really see doing dorms all the time unless we're having a pandemic, to be really honest. Uh, it, it will become costly. I mean, just material wise, it's $150 now. I, I assume those costs will probably drop, but I don't know if it's really worthwhile uh, doing uh, dormitories in, in, in individual buildings uh, on a university campus. Where it may be available is facilities um, for like a, 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 an office building. Uh, you can uh, evaluate if there's a case in there or a military base um, or, or uh, and, and try to make sure that you don't have any cases of illnesses. And you, you actually will get a snapshot if you want, uh, of illnesses within the, your employees, you know, how healthy are your employees? You'll pick up cold viruses, flu viruses. Uh, so you could get an idea. It might be useful to uh, insurance companies, healthcare providers eventually. Yeah. Uh, it's exactly like, where hey, I was going. I think an right. insurance company might turn to any big population and say, install this technology and we'll, we can raise or lower your rates accordingly or provide, uh, you know, if you do the following health, uh, if you get to 90% vaccination for this thing, we'll lower your uh, bulk insurance rate. You could see a really interesting dialogue. There. Well, you could maybe coordinate it with productivity too. You know, it's been shown that absentee, uh, presenteeism costs a company more than absenteeism. You're, you're ill about two or three days a week as an adult, you'll miss work. But you'll go to work three or four weeks a year ill. 
Now, a, a cold, last time I looked, cost a company around 300 bucks if you go to work sick. Uh, if you drop dead, it only costs them 50 bucks because they just have to haul your carcass out of there, right? Very <laughs> low cost. Uh, but if you're sick, that, it, 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 uh, I, I, you, you can cost a company thousands of dollars a year. So what we could do yeah. is buy infectious disease monitoring, uh, or uh, we could get an idea of how much it's costing your company and lost productivity. And then we can evaluate an intervention and say, hey, your productivity, take a look. It's probably increased because you decrease the number of people going to work ill by 50%. Right, so, a lot of opportunity I, I, there, I think, to maybe try to demonstrate. Well, we've always had trouble demonstrating to industry if you like provide disinfecting wipes to employees that it really, we've done models on that, say it reduces the illness rate by 80%. But I would like to think that the cost of taking your dead body out is not the only one. It's also training <laughs> and hiring your successor. I understand that for the category of deans, it might be very low cost, but yeah. there are other people who bring distinctive <laughs> yeah. knowledge and value to the enterprise. <laughs> Good point. I'm going to mention that to people. <laughs> Uh, we, we could actually identify people with chronic illnesses that may, may not be aware of it, too. Uh, there are uh, certain chronic infectious diseases uh, or other chemical indicators, actually, if you really want to do, of chronic diseases. In other words, you could tell, you know, because a lot of, like, uh, let's take uh, papillomaviruses, uh, which cause cancer. We could say you have people that are excreting papillomavirus, which is a cause of cancer. And, and you might want to, to make people aware of they might be screened more effectively uh, by doing that. I mean, we worked on a, and there's a way to prevent papillomavirus. We work with papillomaviruses. So we could get an idea of the incidence maybe of papillomaviruses in a school and saying, you know, it might pay that some kids should get vaccinated because it's spreading through the school because we know as an adult, the risk increase if you're infected with papillomaviruses. Um, so I, I think it might be a good screening tool for that in the future, really, to, to hammer down on some of these chronic illnesses in, in the future. Of employees, uh, you know, you can make recommendations to people in the building or offer a screening test or vaccines to people for certain illnesses that are chronic, uh, or make them aware they should go see a physician. Yeah. Um, but the costs, I think, will be a a factor, but I think that can come down uh, dramatically over time. I think based on these clinical tests and that I, uh, developing and what I see, you could probably get it down to 30 or 40 bucks originally, uh, just about, once it becomes commercialized. Chuck, this is Gary Woodard. You, you mentioned you have uh, sewage on tap from one of the two plants. I'm wondering, do you have samples from both plants where you're producing a daily sort of one number showing the, the amount of COVID in the entire community. And, and if you have that one number daily, uh, are you posting that a time series online? Is that something that, that, the, that the newspaper could, could start to add to, to their statistics? We're thinking of doing that. We, we've developed the model based on our data and we, we've been truth checking it with the recent data. Yeah, we were thinking one community, uh, one, I think, uh, I can't remember what university has a dashboard where it, they estimate the number of cases present now and then the next seven days. That's what we're thinking of doing. I'm hoping to do that. We, we have the model now and we've been truth testing it. It's working out really well so far. So I, I think that's a good I idea. I, I think that's what I'd like to see done. Uh, right there. there. Actually, a lot of Actually, one of my thoughts would be a dashboard of uh, how healthy Tucson is related to Houston, Texas, where they're doing this too. You know that dashboard you see in the newspaper? Hey, diarrhea is up in Houston, Texas. It's down. We have less diarrhea. Maybe that's not the one to pick, but we have less diarrhea. Uh, and there's a shortage of toilet paper in Houston coming. <laughs> Chuck, I'm uh, working now on and have a, a lot of fun developing a set of short stories called Turning Points about what it would be like to live in a sustainable Tucson in 2038 
and what it took to get there. So obviously one of the things we have to deal with in the next 18 years is pandemics. Uh, we probably have more than just the current one. Um, one of the possible responses is for neighborhoods to be able to self-quarantine uh, temporarily. Uh, would something like this be a, a useful in saying you guys are safe today? Yeah, probably could. And you're safe for the next seven to 10 days. Mm -hmm. uh, from what we can see, yeah, you can see not only you're safe today, hey, it's okay to have a block party this week, uh, but I, don't invite anybody from the neighborhood next to you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it could probably could be used that. Uh, yeah, you could hear the concept of, of healthy neighborhoods again to use that, or I was thinking safe neighborhoods, but healthy neighborhoods. You, you know, if you did it by neighbor, you could say this is one of the healthiest neighborhoods in Tucson. <laughs> Or this, hey boy, don't go to this place because they, they got more venereal disease than you can imagine. Maybe you don't want to do it that way, but. Uh, it's just about 10, 10 o'clock and I made a promise to Chuck that I, uh, I would end this by 10. So he and also uh, many of you who have 10 o'clock could jump on those. So uh, thank you all for participating. I think we had 36 or 38 at some point. That was a great number. And again, Chuck, uh, I, I can't thank you enough. Fabulous presentation. The comments from people have been just overwhelmingly appreciative of what you've been saying. Find it incredibly interesting and important. Keep it up. Okay. Thanks, Chuck. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.